Hello again, everybody. This is Mr. Everything, and I'm coming at you with another Wargaming and Miniature video. In this video, we're going to be going over the Lion Rampant rules from Osprey War Games. This is a skirmish game for the medieval period. Uh, it was written by Daniel Mercy, and... Uh, it's not a thick rule book. There's not a lot of rules. It's not super heavy. Uh, there's not a lot of charts and tables. Uh, this is a this is a I consider a fast play game, and uh, it's it's done in a skirmish level. So every man is supposed to represent a single man, and uh, you can play it at any scale. I just have 28 millimeter models mounted on one inch circles. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of go through each chapter and as I go through each chapter to sh explain the rules I'm also going to move models as if we were playing a game using those rules that we're discussing. First of all uh, just as a review of the book it's like any other Osprey book it's put together very well there's a lot of good artwork you know, in the book, there's model pick. Oh, okay, both of those are photographs of models, but there is there is artwork as well from Osprey books. It's just reused from their medieval lines of books, uh, but the miniature photos and the explanation of the rules are pretty straightforward and pretty clean. So I'm um, I'm very happy with that. Daniel goes into like an introduction here, and I don't know if glare is on that, but you don't really need to read it. You just need to see what I'm looking at. Uh, he goes into an introduction explaining how uh, he wanted the game to be fun. He wanted it to be cinematic. He wanted it to be uh, enjoyable for everybody playing. And that sounds perfect. That's that's perfectly aligns with what every, everything I like about a game. Okay, so he talks about what you need to play the game. Well, you need this rule book. You need a list of profiles, and uh, you can get a you can get a roster sheet in the last page. You can just photocopy it, or you can go to the Osprey War Games website and you could download it. You need an opponent, and you need some miniatures for each side. And he says about 40 to 60 models per side is more than enough, and a good handful of D12, um, D6s, about 12 per player, should be fine. A tape measure showing inches, a table, and some markers for showing battered units. All right, now the next thing you would do is you would build an army. And you build that army based on an agreed amount of points between your players, or if you're setting up the game. So you set up your armies based on an allotted number of points. Usually an army is about 24 points. Some units are one point, some units are all the way up to six points. So it just depends on you know, your unit and how you build it up. Like a, man, a mounted man at arms would be six points. A mounted sergeant might be four points. Foot sergeants are four points. And crossbowmen are like four points, stuff like that. And there's a couple of uh, limiting rules. You're not, you're not allowed to have more than four of any one unit type. And you're also not allowed to spend more than 12 points on any one unit type. So if you have men-at-arms, you can't have three men-at-arms because they're six points each. Because six and six would be 12, so you wouldn't have three units. Uh, but if you had a unit that was cheap, like let's say one or two points, you could still only buy four of them. Because they don't want you to have one point and have 24 units on the table, you know. And if you want to abide by like a historical convention or some ideas in the back of the book, um, they give different nationalities, like these Burgundians, let's say, as an example. It says, have one foot men at arms at six points, two expert archers, 12 points, a crossbowman at four points, and one bidder at two points. And there would be your Burgundians. But that's up to you to decide how you want to do it. These are just these are just examples. I wouldn't say they're suggestions. I would just say they're examples. 
they call them sample ret retinues. And that's another thing, you're not forming an army, you're forming what's called a retinue. You have one leader and his men. You will need to designate, once you spend your points and you get your models, you will need to designate one model to be the leader on your side. And that leader is inside one of these units. He doesn't leave it. It doesn't, you, you would just need a, a model that is easily distinguishable from the others and just say, hey, this guy's the leader. So I can say, this guy right there, he is the leader. And then you would do the same thing on the French side, like this guy is the leader. Okay, now I'm gonna display a unit profile right here so you can kind of see the numbers. And uh, let's go ahead and use the foot sergeants as an example. On the left side, you see attack, move, and shoot. And those are the command values. Those are the numbers you have to roll higher than on two die six. Command, courage is all rolled on two dice. Okay, so now for them to, they don't have a shoot value because they're not carrying missile weapons. They don't have javelins, they don't have crossbows or bows. So they can only move or attack. Attack is melee. It should be reworded, I think. Um, okay, and then you have courage. So if you ever need to make a courage test, then you roll two dice and try to beat your courage value. There will be modifiers for all of these. Armor. Um, armor is the number of hits you need to sustain to take a casualty. Uh, now, I'm going to... There are a bunch of games out there that use a roll, counter roll system. So like I'll roll to hit you and you would roll to save. Well, Osprey has eliminated the need for your opponent to roll a save. It's built into his armor value. So because an armor of three means I have to have three successful hits to cause a casualty, what that technically is meaning, if you look behind the scenes, is that I've saved two of them already, but that third one got through. So I must have had something like maybe a four plus armor save. Because if I had a, if I had a, or a four, one to four armor save, so like one to four, one to four, and then, oh, I must roll the five or six. So the armor save is already worked in. That way you don't have an opponent, you rolling, them rolling, you know, back and forth, back and forth, constantly uh, slowing the game down. So that's, that's one thing that I like about this system. It works the armor value in, but it's hidden in the background and it's called armor value. So the armor, if I got six hits, I would cause two casualties. But if I only got five hits, I still only got one casualty. These were saved. Okay, now if you go to attack value, that is the number you have to roll on the die to actually cause a hit. So this, and this has a five, so he attacks, when he's attacking, he's got to roll a five to hit. But when he's receiving an attack, or when he's defending, uh, there, both sides do fight, and he only has to roll a four better. So he's actually better at defending. And then it shows movement, six inches. Some units can move farther than others, like cavalry or light infantry, things like that. And then special rules, this guy has the Shiltron. We'll get into all those in a minute. Okay, another important rule is unit cohesion. Okay, so you've got this unit out here. Okay, you've got this unit, and uh, one of those units has to be the center of attention. And we're going to say this guy is the center of attention because he's not wearing a tabard. These guys all have tabards on. He doesn't have a tabard. He's going to be the center of attention. We call him the, the unit leader. Um, all units must be within three inches of him. So they could be spread out like that if you wanted them to be. Um, but you're not going to want to do that. 
you, or maybe you do. But you can't go three inches there, three inches there, three inches there. No, you can't do something like that. You all have to huddle around your leader. Okay, and something else to keep in mind is that you don't put the units, they don't touch, okay? So you don't, your, your figures in the same unit are never touching unless you're forming a shield wall or a shield turn. If there's other rules that make you form up into tight ranks, that's the only time they touch. Otherwise, you need room to operate. You need room to swing your swords. So you have to be separated. Also remember that two units can never be, this is friend or foe, remember this, two units can never come within three inches of another unit. Units are always separated by at least three inches. This is close to five inches, so they're separated. Uh, that is perfectly fine. But like if you wanted to bring this unit up to here, you couldn't, you would have to go around three inches. You have to stay three inches away from a unit uh, as you maneuver. That's friend or foe. So just remember that. The only time that you can close within three inches is if you're declaring an attack and you're charging them. Okay, now I put a couple of pieces of terrain out here just to show that there are different types of terrain and they will affect the game in some way. Like marshland, wide streams, deep rivers, sometimes like uh, plowed fields and stuff like that are considered rough terrain. Uh, obstacles would be ditches, fences, and walls like that. And then there's obscuring terrain like woods, or maybe a, maybe a building, because if you're behind the building, you're totally obscured, no one can see you. Then there's cover. So remember we talked about this being an obstacle, but that's an obstacle for movement, but it's also cover for shooting. So like if you're behind a fence, a wall, maybe you're in a, in a ditch, uh, they reduce casualties. Then there's such things as impassable, like you can't move over them, like there might be a cliff, or it might be a deep river, or who knows, right? Now, hills are considered cover when defending and you are higher than your attacker. Woods are rough terrain and obscuring terrain and cover. And then walls are obstacles and cover. And buildings are obscuring terrain and cover. There is something like superb cover. But this is to be used sparingly because of the skirmish nature of the game. But a superb cover might be something like a castle wall. Cover adds one to your armor. And uh, superb cover adds two to your armor. Now remember, your armor is how well you resist casualties. It does not prevent them from hitting you. So it's not a plus or a minus to shoot. It's a plus to your armor value. Okay, now we talked about your army leader, like this guy's an army leader, retinue leader, and like that guy's a leader. Leaders affect the game in a variety of ways. One of them is he's part of the unit and he can't leave it. He fights just as an ordinary model. He will be the last man to die in the unit, unless other things might cause him to die. He gives a plus one to all courage tests within 12 inches. So if you're within 12 inches of the leader, your unit is within 12 inches of the, of the leader, you get a plus one to courage tests. They also can issue challenges to the opponent's leader. We'll get into challenges in a bit. Okay, leader skills. I took a picture of it just so you can kind of see what they are. When you start a battle in Lion Rampant, you and your opponent are supposed to roll to see what your leader's abilities are. It's a random thing. You might get what you want. You might not get what you want. So you roll two dice, and there you go. You got forgettable, or you have great leader, or you have commanding, or rash, or sly, braveheart, you know, all these things. 
And if your leader is battered, what that basically means is he's in a unit that's battered, you can't use that skill. All right, so let's talk about what happens in a turn in Lion Rampant. Uh, you've got two opponents. You've got your red player and you've got your blue player. On each turn, you are if it is your turn, you are considered the attacker. And if, you're, if it's not your turn, you're considered the defender. The attacker carries out all of his actions one unit at a time until he fails to perform an action. Once he fails to perform an action, then the turn flips to the other player and he becomes the attacker. Or you might call him the active player if you want. And then in a multiplayer game, uh, you would alternate between all players. So like you would go, it's player one's turn, he fails, and then he goes to player's two turn, he fails, and then it maybe goes to player three's turn, and then he does his movements and fails, and then player four's turn, and then he does his things, and then when he's done, it goes back to one. Or you could you could do like a you could do like a clockwise, or you could do a counterclockwise, or you could do one, two, one, two, however you want to do it. But just to understand that that sequence is the same every turn. And then once all four players or, or both players in a two-player game get a chance to act, that's the end of the turn. And then that's when you decide or see who actually has won the game or not. Now, some scenarios end when one side is wiped out or, or moved off the battlefield, and others end when one of the players has achieved a certain goal. And you can look that up in the scenarios, or you can write your own. Okay, so let's talk about activating your units, because that's really what you do on your turn. When it's your turn, and you're the attacking player or the active player, you have to decide if you want to issue a challenge, and that means if your leader is within 12 inches of your opponent's leader, you can holler across the battlefield and say, hey, I call you out. You can do it. You can do a challenge. If you don't have a challenge, then you go to your battered units. If you have a unit that's battered, it's taken enough casualties where it has failed a morale check and it is battered, you try to rally the battered units. So it's challenge, rally, and then you go to activate wild charges. If there are some units, like mounted men-at-arms, that uh, charge wildly at their opponents, you have to test to see if they, can, if they are forced to do that. And you can only roll or move for one unit at a time. So if you issue a challenge, that unit is done. If you rally for a battered unit, that unit is done. If you roll to see if he does a wild charge, that unit is done. Okay, how to issue a challenge. A leader, if he's within 12 inches of the other leader, uh, you declare that you want to challenge. If you challenge him, your own leader may not attempt wild charges or other activations during the activation phase, but he can rally. Okay, so when you make it a challenge, and for demonstration purposes, we're going to say this was my army leader, and this was my army leader over here, and they're within 12 inches, and this guy says, hey, I challenge you to a duel. Your opponent does not have to accept. He can accept or decline. If accepted, move both models into a space about halfway. This is really just for flavor. You know, you move mountains and because they're gonna they're about to fight it out to the death. If it's refused, the cowardly player's units must each immediately take a courage test, the same way as if the leader was killed, because he's a coward. And issuing a challenge overrides any other actions, because remember, you issue a challenge first. So once the challenge has been issued, the if it's like on a mounted men-at-arms, that would normally have to uh, do a wild charge. But because the leader issued a challenge, then the unit won't move. They're not going to do the wild charge, because it overrides it. And issuing a challenge also prevents units from any ordered activations. Okay, now fighting the duel itself, right? Duels are fought in three blows. So basically what they're saying is both units will roll both men, right? The, the English and the French. They roll three dice. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a mounted guy. It could be a foot guy. It could be a surf. It could be a men-at-arms. It could be a sergeant. 
it doesn't matter because it's man versus man. So you roll three dice each, right? So the red guys get those and the blue guys get those. And you're looking for fives and sixes. So this guy got a five and a six and this guy only got a six. So the French guy won the duel. The British guy or English guy is killed. Remove him from the table. I'm going to put him right there. Your skill and your armor and any of that doesn't come into play. It doesn't matter. It's just whoever rolls the most fives and sixes kill their opponent. If you tied your rolls, they both rolled two hits, then neither one would die and they would both rejoin their units. When a leader dies, every unit in his retinue has to make a courage test. So it's a real good way for an inferior unit to defeat a superior opponent is to duel them because uh, it evens the battlefield, it evens the table. But it also is very risky, it gets your leader killed. Okay, if you have a battered unit, like they've, re they've failed a courage test and they are considered battered, you have to make a courage test. Now, an example that I used earlier with the foot sergeants, right? They have, well, let's look, let's change it. That's not a foot sergeant unit. That's actually a man at arms unit. Okay, a foot man at arms has a courage of three or better. So he has to roll two dice and get a three or better. He's probably going to do it. Uh, but there's modifiers to that normally. If you pass, you remove the battered unit's token. And remember, it can't activate during the activation phase because uh, it used its action basically to remove the batter. If the test is unsuccessful, let's say I roll a two or something, uh, the unit remains battered, removes the model as a casualty, as if he's running away, then it retreats and takes no further action during the activation phase. They would lose a model, right? And then you would retreat away from whatever caused you the, the, uh, the battered result, or in the case of nobody's causing it, you would just move towards your table edge and one a retreat is one full move and so these guys move six inches so you would just move them six inches you have to move them the full six inches you cannot opt to only go two inches or one inch now in this case you cannot you can never move through friend or foe because you can never get within three inches of it, your friend right and and there's not a three inch gap in there and any either way there would have to be a, over a six inch gap because you would have to be three inches away from this unit and three inches away from that unit so there's no way to fit through here so you would have to run around this edge over here that's clear so we would just take it and we would just put it down and we would whoo, run over here we'd have to make sure he's more than three inches away so there we go and then, okay, he's dead. And then, and then you could just take these and kind of do one of these numbers. You don't have to be, you don't have to be super anally, anal about it. You can just continue to move them like that. Now, a failed rally test does not end your side's activation phase. So that's kind of a little out, out of your phase kind of thing. And then you go with, your activations. If there's more than one unit, more than one unit on your side that is battered, you decide which one you want to roll for first. Now, this is something I recommend. Usually, when you roll for a battered unit, it's due to the fact that they've lost a casualty or they've taken a casualty, unless of course it was a courage test for uh, losing your leader. But otherwise, it's usually made when you lose a model. And I recommend using a token per man lost. So like if that was a, let's say that was a unit and it lost two men, I would put two tokens down. That way you know when you make your tests, you're at a minus two. We haven't gone to courage tests, but when we get there, um, I'm kind of jumping around on you and I'm sorry about that. Okay, now activations. When you're going into activating your units, you do one unit at a time. You declare what they're rolling for, you roll for it, and then you perform the action. 
and uh, if you fail the roll, then it turn passes over to your opponent. If you pass the order, you perform the action and then move on to another unit you wish to activate. Okay, your activation phase ends in three ways. If you test to carry out an ordered activation and it fails, or if you test to activate every unit on your side, at least, or you, you've tested every unit on your side, or if you've tested all of your battered units and wild charges, and then decide not to activate anybody. And remember, the failed test for battered units or wild charges does not end your activation phase. Okay, let's talk about moving. A unit can move in any direction. There's no facing. You have a maximum movement. Movement. You don't have to move the full amount. Uh, let's get these guys back, kind of out of the way. There is something I kind of wanted to show you about rough terrain. This is a little nuance that I learned. Um, let's say that I've got... Let's go this way just to kind of show you. Let's say I've got a couple of guys on the outside of the rough terrain, and I've got... Let's call, okay, let's put the leader in the middle. This guy just happens to be trailing. He's like three inches back from the leader, and these guys are scattered in the rough terrain. And these guys are outside the rough terrain, right? This is kind of an unusual little situation. Rough terrain halves your movement. Let's say these guys have a six inch move. Understand you don't want to get caught up in exact measurements and you don't want to be, uh, you don't want to be that anal guy that you know, micromanages his inches. You don't want to be that guy. But you do want to understand that this could really affect how your unit moves. First of all, you have to stay within three inches of the leader. Also, everybody has to stay within three inches of the leader and you do have to half the movement here. Okay, so let's take these guys and let's move them six inches. Okay, so that's, that's a very legitimate movement, right? This guy can move six inches as well. He's right at the edge of the rough. I wouldn't penalize him with any rough. So we move him six inches. This guy's one inch into the rough. So we'll say that counts as two inches. And so he would have, he would only be able to move to there, which is perfectly fine. This guy is two inches in the rough. So that's four inches to get to there. He only has two inches left. Let's move him two more inches. Okay, so far so good. Now this guy, he is four inches into the rough. So let's move him. He can't move that far. He can only move three inches because that's half of six. Okay, now what you're seeing there is an, a formation that now can't exist, right? He is now six inches away from his leader. He can't, he can't, that can't happen. So you don't just pick this guy up and bring him close because that would make him the flash. What you need to do is bring these guys back. The one guy you have to move back is your leader because he has to, this is the slowest man in the unit. Your leader can't be more than three inches from him. Okay, and then let's see if everyone else is in cohesion. No, these guys are like four inches away. So just back them up an inch. And you're good. Now, you don't have to move your full amount. You're always allowed to move less than. You can't move more than your full amount. So if you wanted to, you could bring him back even further if you wanted. You could do that, just to, just to let him get caught up. Each model moves individually in any way he wishes. You can move sideways, backwards, at any angle, because there's no facing. When moving, all models in a unit must aim to end their movement within unit cohesion of the central model. If it's broken for any reason, 
the unit must try to correct this on its next time it moves. Now, the re why I would say if it was broken would be, let's say, he's there, he's there, he's there, he's there, you know, kind of like that. And then all of a sudden, boom, he dies, right? Uh, on the following turn, you'll designate one of these other guys to be the new leader, right? You can swap models out if you want. Or you can just, each turn you can designate a new leader. That's perfectly fine. It's not, he's not actually a permanent fixture in the unit. But let's say he dies. The central model dies. Well, the next time you move, someone's going to have to be the leader. So then you'll have to make sure they all get within three inches of the new leader. They give like an alternate rule in there, like saying that if it's really hot weather or you're in the desert, you might increase their movement number by one to make it harder for them to move each turn or increase their armor by basically making their armor four because everybody's fatigued and it's hard for them to kill someone. Okay, now shooting. Uh, you can shoot only if you're armed with missile weapons like bows, crossbows, javelins, slings. You designate a target that's within range Okay, now I'm going to say that these guys are archers. We know they're not, but let's just say they are. You measure from the closest model to the closest model, or any model to any model. It doesn't matter. Just as long as they're within 12 inches, or whatever range the missile weapon has, because bows and crossbows have 18 inches, slings, mounted bows, and crossbows have 12 inches, and job ones have six inches. So long as one of your models is in shooting range, then all of them are in shooting range. As long as one model is within range, everybody can shoot. Because all it is is just a hail of arrows. It is right? Okay. So there's no firing arcs. Okay. You may choose your own target. An enemy unit able to contact you must be chosen as the target. So if you've got a unit, let's say this unit can move six inches. If they are within six inches of you, you have to target them because they're able to charge you this turn. On their turn, they could activate and charge you. So you have to shoot them. If there's nobody within charge range of you, you can designate the target that you want. If more than one target is available, let's say there's two units that are going to charge you, then you could shoot either one. You cannot split your fire, so you can't take half your dice on one unit and half your dice on the other unit. You can't do that. Uh, you can also, you don't have to have a very large gap. Uh, as long as a, you can, it doesn't have to be three inches like movement. You can just, you can shoot in between units. Units in cover may be targeted, but units may not shoot at targets completely hidden behind trees or buildings. Now, models in your own unit do not block your shots. So, yeah, the guy in the back, he can shoot and all that. Everybody can shoot from that unit. But a friendly unit in front of you or an enemy unit will block shots. You cannot shoot through another unit. But, you, but your own guys can shoot through their own units. Right? You just can't shoot through. Like this unit could not shoot through them at them. Can't happen. And remember, targets that are more than 12 inches away, no, they're within 12. Let's say I was trying to take these guys and shoot at those guys, there would be a minus one to hit them. Okay, and removing casualties. This applies for melee and for shooting. For every hit that I get, you compare it to their armor, and if I meet and exceed that armor value, that's how many guys are killed, right? So, you always roll 12 dice, okay? if your unit's at full strength. Let's say they're at full strength and they're shooting at that unit, the far unit, right? Okay, let's call these guys archers. Archers have a attack value, I'm sorry, they have a shoot value of five plus. Okay, but because it's so long range, they're looking for sixes. Right, you roll all the dice. I got three sixes. And because that's a man-at-arms unit, 
and you already know that foot men at arms have an armor of four, there's no hits. I didn't kill anyone over there. If I was to shoot them, and if I rolled this, I would have had four hits, because all I needed was a five, and four hits would have caused a casualty, and they would have to make their courage test. Now, if a unit is behind cover, and to be considered behind cover, uh, the rule is they have to be within three inches of the cover. So, yeah, so if you're shooting at them, as long as more than half of the unit is behind the cover, so these guys aren't obviously behind cover, but more than half the unit is, they get the cover bonus. And remember, cover adds to their armor. So if it's a man-at-arms unit with a four, then that raises it to five, and then you would have had to do five hits to remove a casualty. Okay, now when a unit that contains the leader takes a casualty, let's say this guy's your army leader, and, this and you take one casualty over here, you have to roll two dice, and if you roll snake eyes, he's actually the one that's killed. It's called a lucky blow. All right, now there's also attacking. Okay, so this unit is going to attack this unit, and so they just run up, make contact, you know, form up with their three inches. As long as you get one unit, one figure base to base, then the units are fighting. The fight is a whole, so this whole unit fights. If you're at full strength, you roll. 12 dice. If you're at half strength or lower, you roll six dice. Okay, but both these units are at full strength. Now, because they're both foot men at arms, their attack value is three. Their defense is four. So because this guy charged, he's rolling and looking for threes, right? And he got... Uh, average roll. So he got that many hits, which is six. We already know their armor is four. So he did two casualty. He did one casualty, and these are wasted. Okay? Now, before they die, or anybody dies, he's going to make his counterattack, and he's trying to roll a four, because he's defending. And he got one, two, three, four... That's enough for a casualty, and then three more, which is wasted. So they both lose one guy. Now, starting with models in contact with the enemy model, both players remove a number of models equal to the casualties inflicted. So this guy and this guy. And if the target unit includes a leader, because it might or might not, uh, if it does include the leader, you roll two dice, and if you roll snake eyes, it's a lucky hit, and the leader dies. Uh, a unit taking casualties must test courage, as noted in ending the attacks. So they both, in this case, would have to make a leader test, or a, I'm sorry, a, a courage test. And uh, if they both pass, then the defending unit has to retreat, or the attacking unit has to retreat. If they both fail, they both become battered and they both retreat their movement. If one or the other fails, it will move back battered. The other one won't. But if it's a tie, draw, nobody fails their courage test, the attacker does have to back up. It says the unit that removed the most casualties must retreat if both units suffered equal casualties the attacking unit retreats. Now, if you're fighting in rough terrain, uh, this is... Okay. So, the majority of this unit is not in the rough terrain. Or, even if even if these guys were, like, out, totally outside the rough terrain, and these guys were totally inside the rough terrain, the entire fight would be considered rough terrain. Because uh, the fighting takes place 
If it's partially in rough terrain or some of it's in rough terrain, the entire fight is considered rough terrain. When you're fighting in rough terrain, your attack and defense values are considered five. So the advantage of this being like this is, remember they had a three attack and a four defense. So yeah, four is a really good number, but a three is better. But now when they charge in, everyone has the same number, a five. And everyone's armor value becomes a two, not a four like these guys have. So that's a really good thing for serfs and and peasants that have a horrible fighting value and a horrible armor, by getting into rough terrain, you balance the playing field because now everybody's got the same attack and the same defense. So you basically eliminate their ability to be awesome. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about testing for courage. I know I've kind of gone over it a little bit, I've mentioned it, we played around with it. But testing courage has a few modifiers and a few nuances. <clears throat> when do you actually test? Well, every time you take a casualty from shooting or hand-to-hand. -hand. If you're trying to rally from being battered. If you're the last unit on the table, you have to roll. If your leader is killed or flees the table. Or if your leader refuses a challenge. And lastly, if your retinue, your entire army, loses half of its point value. So the first three situations uh, apply to that individual unit. And then when it talks about the leader being killed or the leader refusing a challenge or the retinue is half its value, then that applies to your entire retinue. Now, if two or more of these factors apply to you, only make one test. Okay, so how do you test? You roll two dice and add the total together. We know that. From this total, subtract one from every casualty that the unit has suffered in the game so far. Subtract one more if your retinue is at half strength. Add one if your leader is within 12 inches. And you compare the result to your modified courage score. If you're equal to or better than your courage score, there's no effect. And if you're trying to remove a battered, you rally one and everything's good. If the score is lower, you failed the test. Okay, on a failed test, if your score is still greater than zero, you retreat and you become battered. If you fail the score and your score is zero or a negative number, your unit loses heart completely and is removed from the game. And remember, a battered unit that fails a battered result loses a model in addition and continues to retreat. Okay, retreating. When a unit retreats, it has to move directly away from the unit that caused the retreat and go three inches and not go within three inches of any other unit. So, this is... This is kind of tricky. Um, let's say I've got this cavalry unit within three inches of them, right? I've got this unit within three inches of them, right? And then I've got this unit within three inches of them, or right at three inches, let's just say. So there's not a gap between the units, and they're, everybody's within, everybody's three inches apart, that's fine. And then the enemies get a unit here at three inches, a unit here at three inches. Basically, they're completely surrounded. A unit comes in, causes a courage test, they have to retreat, but there's nowhere to retreat to because you're completely surrounded. Or there's an impassable terrain like a cliff or a deep river. If unable to retreat the full distance required, the unit cannot retreat its full move. It moves as far as possible and then rolls one die. Compare the result to its courage if the die roll is lower than the unit's courage, it has to remove a number of models equal to the die roll. So if these guys have a courage of four, and I roll a die, and I got a four, it's not lower than the courage. 
This is the only situation where a unit may remain within three inches of another unit. So basically, because they were unable to retreat, you have to roll a die. Like in this case, I would remove one more model. Boop, and pull them off. Now, units are retreating off the table. If any model from a unit moves off the table as a result of a retreat, remove the entire unit and count it as routed. And terrain affects the distance moved during a retreat in the same way as any other movement. So if I'm like in rough and I have to do a retreat of six inches, they would have still only moved three inches because of the rough terrain. When a unit becomes battered, right? Like that's, that unit has lost three guys, it's battered. I would put three tokens down just to represent the three casualties that it has. That's just a way for me to keep track. Must test to remove a battered marker at the beginning of the turn. May not be activated other than rally. If it's attacked, it fights back with only a six to hit. And it can only move as a result of a failed courage test. So you roll, you pass, these come off and it's no longer battered, but it turns over. If you fail, another guy gets removed and it retreats. Do, 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 do. And that's the only time he could move. Ending the game. In Line Rampant, battles are rarely fought for a set number of turns as gameplay is so fluid. Because of this, scenarios should be defined by points to prevent games grinding on to the end. Uh, the last two units dragging themselves across the tabletop when the players would prefer to go home. Victory in a game of Lion Rampant is decided by amount of glory points a retinue amasses at the end of the game. Okay, if you're playing without a scenario, keep playing until a turn begins with five or fewer units remaining in the game. That's from both players. So two of versus three, that would be five. When this happens, roll a die at the start of the turn. If the score is higher than the number of units left on the table, this is the final turn, and it's time to add glory. Okay, so if you've got two units left over here, he's got three units left over here, that's a total of five. If I roll a five or a six, we end the game. But because I rolled a one, we keep going. Because if you get down to, like, let's say, two units, one on each side, then all I have to roll is a two or better, or I still roll the one, so the game would keep going. But if I roll the two or better, the game would end, and you'd count glory. Okay, now here's a little tricky rule here. It says, if you've built yourself the perfect retinue and find yourself with one or two points left over, rather than spending them on an additional units of bidders or serfs, you can instead go into the battle with a reduced retinue and claim an extra 0.5 glory at the end of the game, regardless of the outcome. But you can't gain more than that by reducing more points. Then they so say fielding a historically plausible retinue is you could always go to WRG, Armies of Feudal Europe, Armies of the Middle Ages, Armies of the Crusaders. You can go to Field of Glory and get like Swords and Scimitars, Oath of Fealty, Storm of Arrows, which is the book I have. And then, or you can go to Osprey Publishing, the Men at Arms series, the Campaigns, and the Warrior series. As kind of a, a personal, personal opinion, they put the unit profiles in the middle of the book. Okay? The, literally, the middle of the book. I don't like the unit profiles in the middle of the book. I wish the unit profiles were the last thing in the book. Uh, that's just me. They put the scenarios after the unit profiles, which I guess is considered logical, but it just doesn't, it's just not easy for me to get to the units. I don't like having to go to the middle of the book to find the units. So be sure to, once you form your retinues, to write down their abilities on your roster sheet. Don't write it on this one because it'll be a waste. Go ahead and download and print those roster sheets. And you can actually do black and white ones and you can scale them to the size of your paper. I've done these. And then write down all their abilities. That way you don't have to flip through the book. Okay, now on each of the units, they will have what's called like a special rule. 
So you go to the mounted men at arms, special rules, they have wild charge. Tells you what it does. Counter charge tells you what it does. Archers, and they have upgrades too. So like my archers, because they're longbowmen on the English side, um, I upgraded them to expert because it says archers may be upgraded to expert representing both better bow technology such as longbows or better training. Archers have higher rate of fire than crossbow armed units as represented by their better shoot value. So not that they can't shoot every turn because crossbows can, it's just their shoot value is lower because the bows have a higher rate of fire. And there's various different rules like that throughout the book. Uh, and then there's a bunch of scenarios. And then at the end, they give you the sample retinues, which I think the sample retinues should be in the back. And then there's a lion rampant reference sheet, which is only one page. And that's just to give you some of the modifiers. I think it's I think it's an awesome set of rules. Uh, I was noticing this last night when I was reading the rules, the way it's bound, um, it's not just glued to the binding. There's actually, it's actually, I don't know if you can see that in the camera. It's actually corded. There's cords holding it like a, like a bound book. And yeah, if I, if I was to use this for about a year, just constantly flipping through and looking stuff up and doing stuff like that. I think it would get worn out. I really do. I think it get I think it get horribly worn out. So I'm going to try to take care of it. It's not like my other Osprey books that you pull out every now and then and look at the pictures, read and get painting ideas and do a little research and then you put it on your shelf. This would be just constantly being pulled out and read and stuff like that. All right. So on a scale of like 1 to 10, on authenticity, it's hard to it's hard to say that it's going to be an authentically historically accurate, right? Because they lump category. It's it's broad spectrumed. So they're saying all men at arms are just men at arms. So a man at arms with a sword and a shield, and a man at arms with an axe, or a man at arms with a uh, bill or something like that these are all lumped in together as men at arms now you can upgrade them okay hold. now men at arms they say upgrades there's none so you can't differentiate between different types of men at arms because they're all pretty upgraded as they are now foot sergeants you can they start with a shieldron which that's their core unit that's the spears or uh, a shield wall and then you can upgrade them to expert, giving them a higher skill level, giving them a attack value of four, and but they can no longer form children. That's representing like uh, two-handed weapons or they're your squires, right? They can be upgraded expert, which represents two-handed chopping weapons such as bills, halberds, and axes. So on authenticity part of it, I'm saying it is authentic because it lumps all this together, but on the flip side, it's also not detailed to the point where a bill is different than a halberd, you know, but who, do you really need to, do you really care that a two-handed axe is going to be different than a halberd? I mean, I don't really need that much granularity. I just want it to be fun and fast. So, authenticity, I'm going to give it like a seven, maybe a, close to an eight. And then uh, playability, I'm going to give it a 10 because I think it's super fast, easy to play. Fun, it's a 10. The amount of time it takes to play is a 10. The, uh, the layout of the book, the organization of the book, I'm actually going to give it a 7 because I don't like the unit stats in the middle of the book. I prefer it to be at the end of the book. And... Uh, but the understandability of the rules, it was super easy to understand. Give that at least a 9 or a 10. So overall, I'm giving this set of rules a 9 out of 10. All right, thanks for coming out and checking out this uh, Lion Rampant 
review slash tutorial, and I'll see you in the next one.